Holy Spirit to pray on our behalf. Hold on.
Good evening to you, one and all. Thank you again for coming out. Some of you have been here twice. That's a miracle in itself to come and listen to me. But um, some of you have been here every night and they, you have really encouraged me personally. But most of all, we've been coming around the Word of God and that's the most important thing. So thank you for your encouragement once again. I will cover your prayers just for tomorrow evening because I have this little thing during the day that I have to deal with called employment. <laughs> and it gets in the way sometimes whenever you're trying to do something like this. But there we are. I'm thankful for it. But let's come to Leviticus 23 again tonight. I'm just going to pour a little glass of water before we start. Leviticus 23, we're coming to verse 26 this evening, please. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is the day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. He shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Amen. And again, may the Lord bless the reading of his own inspired and fallible word. We have discovered that the feasts recorded for us here in Leviticus 23 present us with not only a schedule of annual events for Israel to keep, but also a prophetic calendar of events. The Lord calls them my feasts. They are the feasts of the Lord. He ordained them, he has, and he will fulfill them. And prophetically, they present the plan of salvation for mankind. They each teach us something distinctive in relation to that plan, but we can also notice certain things as we consider them as a group. We noted last night the first three feasts point to things that occurred at Christ's first advent. Passover, his death, the lamb, unleavened bread, the putting away of sin, the result, if you like, of Passover, first fruits, his resurrection. And then we came to the fourth feast, and it points to something that is in the present. We found their Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was given and the church was born, was established, and it continues to this day. We are in that in the present day. The last three feasts each point to things that are yet to be fulfilled, things that will occur with his second advent, things that are in the future. We looked at the Feast of Trumpets last night. We thought about Christ's return to the air for his bride, to the earth in glory, and the regathering of his people Israel. And that's in particular what we considered last evening. In our application of these truths, we've been using the calendar as our theme. We've thought about different types of day that we can have on our calendars, and we've sought to make spiritual application from what we find in these feasts of the Lord. The sixth type of day that we're coming to this evening is perhaps the type of day that we would rather not find in our calendar from a purely natural perspective. Solemn days. We all have solemn days in our calendars on occasions. There are days of grief. There are days of mourning. There are days that involve events that are difficult to endure. However, and this is one of the major points that we're going to find when we consider the feast, which is our subject for this evening. There are also days that fall under this title of solemn, which involve reflection, 
and they involve remembrance, not despair. There are aspects of solemn events that cause us to be thankful as we look back upon them. The Feast of Atonement included those aspects of remembrance. The Feast of Atonement points to reconciliation. What have we seen thus far from Israel's perspective in particular? They were to recognize Passover. Their redemption was met by God by means of the Lamb. They were to recognize unleavened bread. They were to live their lives in obedience and faithfulness to Him. They were to recognize first fruits. The first and the best of their harvest was due to God in recognition that it was all His. They were to recognize Pentecost, a celebration of the early harvest, again recognizing God's provision. And they were to recognize the Feast of Trumpets, the period of rejoicing which was to come, something in the future, something that would be fulfilled, recognizing God's fulfillment. So what did atonement mean to them? Atonement meant the acknowledgement of their sin their need of forgiveness, their need of cleansing, and recognizing that it could only be met by God, it can only be met by God. Take a little look again at verses 26 and 27 of our text this evening. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. Now the first thing to notice here, and it's already been mentioned this evening, is how this feast is referred to. It is specifically referred to as a day, a day of atonement. None of the other feasts in this chapter are referred to in that way as a day. Yes, we, we read the word day on numerous occasions throughout the chapter, 35 times in all, but not in this fashion, not to describe the feasts. However, this is described as a day of atonement. The Day of Atonement was one of the most important days in Israel's calendar. In fact, I'm led to believe that they refer to this simply as the day. It was so important. Leviticus 16 provides us with the detail of what occurred on that great day each year. It was certainly a solemn day. Offering for sin was made for the priest. Offering for sin was made for the people. Sins they knew they had committed, but also sins of ignorance. You see, all of their sins were to be covered, were to be dealt with. See, first of all, this evening, when we think about this day of atonement, it was a day of necessity, a day of necessity. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. On the tenth day of the seventh month, the sixth of these feasts of the Lord, why was this feast to be held at that time? Why was the feast of atonement not the first of the feasts? given what atonement involved. We thought about Passover pointing to salvation, unleavened bread pointing to sanctification, first fruits pointing to resurrection, Pentecost pointing to habitation, the indwelling of the Spirit, trumpets pointing to restoration. Then is it not a backward step to ordain a feast that relates to atonement? Think about Israel just for a moment. Think about what the fulfillment of these feasts means for them. What has been their fundamental problem? It has been sin, just like you and I. Why were they dispersed from the promised land the first time? Because of their unbelief, because of their sin. What will happen when they are regathered? Well, we noted it last night, and we'll look at it a little bit deeper later on, there will be recognition on their part. Zechariah 12 and 10 says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. What will it mean to them to accept him as the Messiah? It will mean realization. They are going to realize their sin. He had carried out the work of atonement the first time that he came. He died for them. He dealt with their sin. What is atonement? It was William Tyndale who, through his work of translation, provided us with words such as Passover and scapegoat, which we're going to see a little later on. But he also gave us the word atonement. He wanted a word that would present Christ's work on the cross, a word that would comprise how sin was dealt with and the result for the believer. He invented the word atonement. Its meaning is contained in the presentation of the word itself. When you break it down, at one meant. In other words, Christ's sacrifice on the cross has provided the, the only way of salvation for the sinner as Christ has paid the price and satisfied God's justice. A sinner who has repented of their sin, trusting Christ for salvation, is at one with God. The relationship has been restored, and that restoration has been achieved by the sacrifice of Christ, the only way. There is no atonement without the shedding of blood. This was a day of necessity. We can see that that necessity in the name given to this day, in the responsibilities of the priest, in the responsibilities of the people, in the offerings that were to be made. These things spoke of cleansing from sin. They spoke of removal of sin. They spoke of forgiveness. All achieved by blood. A blood sacrifice. The doctrine of atonement. Why must we continue to preach it? Why must we continue to stress it? Because it is a precious doctrine that is so often under attack in this day. And we who have been given the understanding of it must share it and we must defend it. Every generation in the church must receive a sound, in-depth teaching of this great truth, friends, because it is a necessity. Every believer needs to understand it, needs to appreciate it. There are those who may have been saved very early in life and, and yet have never developed their understanding of salvation much further and their understanding of substitution and their understanding of atonement much further since that day. We live in a day when there are Christians and the sum total of their theological knowledge and their application is smile, God loves you. God does love us. But aren't these things so important? I'm not suggesting that we need to complicate things. I'm simply stating that this doctrine is essential to our salvation and it needs to be proclaimed and it needs to be believed and it needs to be appreciated. The day of atonement, it was a day of necessity. Secondly, I want you to see that it was a day of humility. Look at verse 27 again. Also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement that shall be in holy convocation unto you and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Ye shall afflict your souls. That word afflict, what does it mean? If we delve into it and look at its translation, it means to stoop down. It means to be worried about. It means to be concerned about something. And so there is acknowledgement involved here. I read today that the Maasai tribe of West Africa have an unusual way of saying thank you. Those who translate explain that when the Maasai express thanks, they bow down and they put their forehead on the ground and they say, my head is in the dirt. That's how they say thank you. You see, thanksgiving, friends, requires humility requires humility. What did the Day of Atonement involve? Turn with me to Leviticus in chapter 16. 
I'm not going to make any lengthy reading from this chapter, but I am going to point out some verses and ask you to glance at them as we move through the study this evening. But it's there that we find the fuller details, the instructions for the Day of Atonement. And we'll refer to a number of verses in it as we continue. This great day involved, first of all, acknowledgement of sin. Ye shall afflict your souls. They needed to acknowledge their own condition. They needed to acknowledge their need. Now, a study of atonement will mean little or nothing to the believer or the unbeliever alike without an acknowledgement of sin, an acknowledgement of the depravity of man. We were born in sin, shapen in iniquity. There is no good in us in and of ourselves. None are righteous. We were born with a fallen nature. Can I suggest that this is sometimes sometimes where we may get the gospel wrong. Sometimes we try to apply things at the wrong time and, and in the wrong way. Shouldn't we be looking at this from the point of view of law to the proud, grace to the humble? You see, whenever you see yourself for who you are, the sinfulness of your sin, the atonement is going to mean so much more to you, whoever you may be. And without acknowledgement of sin... Atonement means little or nothing. Prior to salvation, we were spiritually dead, condemned. The words of the Lord himself, he that believeth not is condemned already. Lost in sin. Sin, that vile thing. Sin which is completely contrary to God and his characteristics. Sin, that thing that destroys, that restricts that causes pain, that stifles growth, that prevents, that deserves judgment, that results in death. The wages of sin is death. The Scottish Presbyterian minister, Alexander White, was highly regarded, but he had a personal awareness of the potential for sin and how easily he and we could fall into it. On one occasion after a church service, a young woman came to him and said that she loved being in his presence because he was so saintly. And rather surprised by this, Alexander White looked at her with a sense of solemnity and said, Madam, if you could look into my soul, what you would see would make you spit in my face. We need to see sin, friends, for what it is. So often, that's not done today. Sin is played down. It is rationalized, even in Christian circles. We need to see it for how serious it is, what its consequences are. Sin is something which separates from God. Sin brings destruction. Sin brings death. Sin brings judgment. Unrighteousness. That's man's problem, isn't it? Always has been. The Day of Atonement involved the acknowledgement of sin. The Day of Atonement also involved the acknowledgement of God. You've turned to Leviticus 16 there. Take a look from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Note the presence of God. I will appear. Aaron couldn't enter just any time. That he come not at all times, it says. He could only enter in God's time. Aaron couldn't enter in just any way. Verse 2 says, thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. There were instructions to be followed. He could only enter God's way. Divine judgment had already been executed on those who approached another way. Turn for a moment to Leviticus and chapter 10. Keep your finger in Leviticus 16 and go to Leviticus chapter 10. And we'll read about this occurrence from verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them as censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon 
and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron, And unto Eliezer, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. And lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go... F- ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. It would appear that these men offered fire which wasn't from the brazen altar. For us, the altar speaks of Calvary. There is no other way to God but through his Son. For the unbeliever tonight, all paths do not lead to heaven. All paths do not lead to God. But for the believer tonight, note verse 3, the Lord said, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. We come before God as spiritual priests, and our worship must be appropriate. Others, believers and unbelievers, They see our worship, and God would be glorified before them. Our worship isn't about pleasing ourselves. It's about reverencing Him. Matthew Henry wrote, If God be not sanctified and glorified by us, He will be sanctified and glorified upon us. Isn't it sad when we read in 1 Corinthians 11 and 30, as Paul writes to those Corinthians and all of the problems that they had got themselves into. And he said, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For the Corinthians, there had to be disciplinary action because they had not judged sin in their own lives. Don't we need to do that? Don't we need to do that even before we come to the table week by week, examining ourselves as we come before him? Friends, I'm not talking about being legalistic, talking about acts of worship, talking about reverence, talking about this acknowledgement of sin and acknowledgement of God that we're thinking about tonight. The Day of Atonement is not some old meaningless ritual to be written off with no significance for us today. Its rituals and offerings are some of the greatest types of our Savior's atoning work that we could ever consider. The defense may go up, but we're not under law, Peter. We're under grace. That's true. But sometimes we can talk very loosely about grace, can't we? As if we were its author. God is its author, and Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Christ fulfilled the law. For us, it has been rendered inoperative. But in doing so, he didn't simply cast it aside. He didn't simply ignore it. He accomplished what was demanded. God has a standard that only Christ could meet, and he met it for us. The law remains the schoolmaster to show the sinner their sin and to bring them to repentance and faith in Christ. Yes, in Romans 6 and 15, we find that free is not under law, under grace, but it can't be lifted out and quoted with its context ignored. What do we read at the end of that chapter? In verse 15 of chapter 6 of Romans, we read, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You see, there's resultant fruit and there's evident life from being freed from the law and coming under grace. The Mosaic Covenant is no longer in effect, but there can be a a misunderstanding of the New Covenant. We can treat it and treat grace like some sort of all-access pass to do as we please. 
with our liberty in Christ. No, we're not under law. We're not under that law of Moses. But friends, what is it saying? Galatians 6 and 2, fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 8 and 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And Paul wrote that all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. How can we apply that? I think I've used this illustration before. I don't know whether it was here or somewhere else, but I'm allowed to go over to the leisure center, not too far from me, just a few miles down the road and go to the swimming pool and climb up to the top diving board, the highest one that I can find, and dive into that pool all those meters below. I'm at perfect liberty to do that. There's no one, there's nothing, and there's no law to stop me. But I can tell you that it wouldn't be expedient for me to do that because I can't swim. It would be foolish. It may cause harm not only to me, but potentially to others. Are we, as believers, are we living before God in the way that we are? As we live before God and before men, we should seek to be like Paul, who lived in such a way as to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. The day of atonement involved acknowledgement of sin. The day of atonement involved acknowledgement of God. We ought to have acknowledgement of our own sin and inadequacy and acknowledgement of the presence and the holiness of God. Not to dwell on those things, not to dwell in guilt. Christ has freed us from that. But how was Aaron to approach? Look back again at Leviticus 16 and see verse 3. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. You see, God has his order. What was there to be? There was to be a sin offering for the priest. There was to be a burnt offering for the priest. There, were to be, there was to be specific clothing. There was to be ceremonial cleansing. There was to be a sin offering for the people, a burnt offering for the people. Why? It all spoke of uncleanness, didn't it? The priest and the people were unclean and unsuitable for God's presence in that condition. Offerings were therefore required. The priest had to bathe, to be immersed, to have a cleansing from head to foot. The priest had to dress in holy garments, covering him from head to foot. The full, high priestly garments were rich in color and rich in meaning, but here he must wear only the white linen coat, the breeches, the girdle, and the mitre. Why? Because those were the holy garments. They spoke of purity. There was no glorious dress here. And friends, Christ, our great high priest, made atonement for sin. How? Not with pomp, not with pride, not with glorious dress. He made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. On the day of atonement, sin offerings and burnt offerings were required. Aaron was only to going to gain access by sacrifice, by blood. Furthermore, Aaron couldn't approach without preparation. Verse 2 says, For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Now consider it, friends. The fear of God. The fear that there was that day. God's presence approaching God to stand before God where there was a visible manifestation of God's glory. He was going to stand before God. Sin needing dealt with. Not an empty ritual. This was for real. How do I approach God? Do I have a high view of God? 
Do I have proper worship when I come before him? Do I have acceptable worship in his presence? You see, he's the same God today, isn't he? The law has changed. The covenant has changed. The economy has changed. The dispensation has changed. But God has not changed. The same God in all his holiness and purity and righteousness, and we approach his very presence. It's humbling, isn't it? Animal sacrifice is no longer required, but I can only enter in through Christ because of his sacrifice. And just as Aaron had to prepare, surely there's preparation that is required as we approach God. Again, not wanting friends to be, to be legalistic and put us back under something that we've been brought out of, but surely we must prepare. Surely there must be consideration. God has his order. Consider who he is. He's the same God. He couldn't look upon sin then. He will not look upon it now. We cannot live how we please and then turn up for church on Sunday. We cannot continue in sin and grief as spirit and turn up to worship. If we do that, is it any wonder that sometimes our devotional time with God is affected? Our prayer meetings are barren and dry. There's so little evidence of God at work in our midst. But when we fear Him, when there is that reverential fear of God and all of His holiness and majesty and power and glory, and how He has looked upon us in mercy, and provided his own son as a perfect sacrifice for sin, then our worship is real. Our appreciation is deeper. The singing of our hymns is with sincerity. We hear him through his word, and we know it is the voice of God, the sovereign, almighty, eternal, holy, righteous, all-glorious God. We cannot run before him without due thought. We cannot treat him as our mate. We must reverence him as God. We need a high view of God. Do we realize who we approach? Is there preparation in our approach to him? Is there humility? The day of atonement, it was a day of necessity. The day of atonement, it was a day of humility. And thirdly, tonight, the day of atonement, it was a day of solemnity. Come again. Or flick back over, if you would, to Leviticus 23 and look at verse 29. You'll be going back to 16 again, by the way, so keep your finger in it. Verse 29 of chapter 23, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that's the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. You see, this was serious stuff. Sin needed to be dealt with. Speaking here of souls being cut off, if they didn't follow these rules, these regulations, these instructions. Ye shall afflict your souls. We've already seen what that meant. What was it about for Israel? They were not instructed to afflict their souls in order to achieve this atonement, rather to acknowledge and to remember. There was a great awareness of the seriousness of sin on this solemn day, and they were to keep this day, this feast before the Lord. There was a great awareness of the holiness of God on this day and the need for peace with God. That was then. But how does it fit with their future? Christ carried out the ultimate work of atonement on Calvary's cross. But some might say, sure, Israel had rejected him. Well, we've already thought about the Feast of Trumpets and their regathering in a future day. And at that time, the nations will come against them. But what will happen at that time? We've already read from Zechariah 12 and 9 and part of verse 10 of that chapter, but let me read a little further in that passage. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace 
and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And then what? What will they do when they realize who he is? And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. There will be a realization of who Christ is. And Israel shall mourn for him when they realize that he is the one who had come to them and they previously rejected. Leviticus 16 is filled with typology, but Christ is the antitype. He actually fulfilled it. Do we understand it? Do we appreciate the significance of this? I want you to take a look at some of the verses with me as we finish off this evening. What was conducted on that great day of atonement? First of all, atonement was required for the priest. He had to deal with his own sins before the sins of the people. What does he do? He presents the bullock of the sin offering. It was an atonement for self and family. He had to kill it. The shedding of blood was absolutely essential. If you look down there at verses 12 and 13, you'll see that the high priest offered incense. Incense is a symbol of prayer. There there was a covering of the Shekinah glory with prayer that God might not pour out his wrath upon the sinner, that he die not is the phrase. And again, can we appreciate the holiness of God? In verse 14, we read about the sprinkling of blood. It was to atone for the sins of the priest. Atonement was required for the priest because of his sin. But you know something, friends? When we look to Calvary, when we look to the antitype of what we have in this passage, we know that Christ had no sin of his own. Christ did not require atonement for himself. Not like this priest. So there was atonement required for the priest. There was atonement then required for the people. The priest had already entered into the Holy of Holies once, and then he entered in again. And we read about the first goat in that passage. The sin offering there had to be killed, verse 15. The shedding of blood was absolutely essential. And again, it reminds us it was absolutely necessary for Christ to die that we might live. The priest enters the Holy of Holies the second time with the blood of the goat, the sin offering for the people. He is to sprinkle the blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. In verse 16 there, we read that um, he shall make an atonement for the holy place. Now, why was that? Well, first of all, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, we read. They were unclean. They were impure. And then also because of their transgressions, we read. They were rebels. They had broken the law, broken the law of Moses. Then we read another phrase, in all their sins, their thorough sinfulness. It was all going to be atoned for. It was all going to be dealt with. The people were unclean, so the place was defiled. In summary, what are we saying? Cleansing was required. Atonement is required for the sinner today because of their sin. Something else that we know very well, Hebrews chapter 10, you know the verses, you don't need to turn to them. We know there that the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies more than once. That's what we're seeing here in Leviticus. We read in Hebrews 10 and and verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all once. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, what a wonderful verse this is. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We could take the rest of our time tonight thinking about that verse, that wonderful verse. Christ entered in once with a perfect, once for all, never to be repeated, blood sacrifice for sins. How long is it good for? Forever. 
I always remember Ian Paisley's headings on this particular verse. I really hope it's okay to quote him in here. But I've heard him preach on this particular verse, and his headings were so simple and yet so profound. He said this about verse 12. But this man, who is this man? What has he done? Where is he now? Who is this man? He is the very Son of God. What has he done? He has given himself a sacrifice for our sins. Where is he now? Friends, he is in the glory and he is interceding for us. And we are in him as believers. What else do we note from Leviticus 16? Well, the blood had to be applied. Verses 15 and 16. It had been shed, but if it had been left in the bowl, no cleansing would have occurred. It had to be applied. Where was it applied? The Holy of Holies. It was a place of holiness. It was upon the mercy seat, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant with, with those carvings of the cherubim on it and, and the tablets of the Ten Commandments within. Where was atonement made for this sinful people in a separated holy place where God's righteousness and holiness were represented? Isn't it wonderful that God's mercy was revealed in such a place? Calvary the place where wrath and mercy met. And whoever you are, has Christ's blood been applied to your soul? It's necessary. In verse 17, we see that no one else was in the tabernacle when the priest goes in to make atonement. There was no man in the tabernacle when he went in to do that until he came out. Only when atonement had been made for the priest for his family and for the people, could anyone else enter in? Only Christ could make atonement for our sin. And he did the work alone. And since he has done so, the way is opened up. The veil is rent in twain, and we may enter. And not only the Jew, but the Gentile, because the middle wall of partition has been broken down in Christ. There's entrance not only once a year, but forever. It's a new and living way, as we read in Hebrews. The sinner doesn't need an earthly priest. The sinner doesn't need an animal sacrifice. There's no fear of death if you are in Christ. We read that he sprinkled the blood seven times. We've looked at that number on uh, numerous occasions this week. It speaks to fulfillment. It speaks to completeness. The atonement Christ made for us is complete. We are made right with God only through his work and it is acceptable to God. It is sufficient to save the vilest sinner. The blood of the first goat had to be shed before sin could be removed. The next chapter tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And then in verse 20 here, we begin to read of the instructions concerning the second goat, the live goat. But I want you to note the timing. Because we read, when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. In other words, the blood of the first goat had to be shed first. There was no removal of sin without the shedding of blood first. And then in verse 21, we read, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. What's that? It's identification. The live goat was brought and the hands of the priest were placed upon it. The goat was identified with the people in that sense, in that way. Christ was numbered with the transgressors. He identified himself with you and I. He identified with those he came to see it, the sinner. Again in verse 21, the priest confessed all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat. The sins of Israel are transferred then to the live goat. What is it? It's substitution. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. Christ became our substitute and bore the punishment for our sin. Judgment fell, and it fell on him. The Father poured out his divine wrath upon his Son that we could be saved. You know, when we think about Passover and we considered it on Sunday morning, judgment fell, didn't it? Judgment fell on the Lamb and on every firstborn of Egypt. It fell on every household where the blood had not been applied. 
those whose sins were not covered. What do we read in that great chapter of Isaiah 53 and verse 10? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. We're thinking here about substitution. Penal substitutionary atonement. It simply means that Christ bore punishment, your punishment, my punishment, took our place, endured the wrath of God as your substitute to bring you to God. And by His grace, you can be saved through faith in Christ because of that substitutionary work and only because of it. That is a doctrine, again, that is under attack from so many sides today. There are those who will not accept it because it's too harsh for them. It doesn't fit their opinion of what love is and what God should be and how He should conduct Himself. Friends, you know something? There's nothing unholy about God's wrath. Will God discard His wrath and cease to be righteous? Will God sweep sin under the carpet? That is not love. That is not true love. True love and divine justice deals with sin. And that's what God has done. God's wrath is not uncontrolled rage, uncontrolled fury. He is just. Is it not holy and pure and blessed and something to give Him thanks for that He hates the very thing that has destroyed the relationship between Himself and His creatures? Sin. There's no salvation without penal substitutionary atonement. Christ was punished for our sin. We read then in verse 21 that the goat was sent away by an appointed man into the wilderness. That's an interesting phrase. What is this all about? Here is removal. An appointed man was to take it and lead it away. In Peter's first gospel message, that great message in front of those that multitude that we read of in Acts chapter 2. He refers to Christ as Jesus Christ, a man approved of God. He then refers to him as being delivered by God. And then he states that he was raised by God. He was appointed for the purpose of taking away our sin. And he did it perfectly. Hebrews 9 and 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Where did the appointed man take that second goat? Verse 22, Unto a land not inhabited. What's that? It's separation. The one who has trusted Christ for salvation has had their sin removed, and it's removed forever. There's defilement that we see in chapter 16 and some of the closing verses, 32 to 34. Let me just read them to you. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. You see the extent of the defilement, all that needed to be cleansed, all that needed to be purified. And at the close of the chapter there in 16, chapter 16, we read this, and this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. There's no atonement without the shedding of blood. It's the same today, isn't it? But the blood is different. It's not animal blood. No matter how spotless and pure the animal was in its appearance, its blood could never take away sins. But at Calvary, the blood of Christ was shed. Peter calls it the precious blood of Christ. What does it mean for Israel in that future day, this atonement? Through the prophet Zechariah, in chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord says, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. How and why? Because atonement has been made. This is all upon the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. Atonement. 
There was solemnity in this feast, wasn't there? And Zechariah prophesies solemn days that lie ahead for Israel. But this solemnity will eventually lead to rejoicing. Are there solemn days in your calendar, believer? As you remember him and all that he suffered and all that he endured on your behalf and on mine. As you come before him in repentance of those sins that you fall into sometimes so easily, day and daily. But through a blood sacrifice, friends, there is peace with God. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. There's solemnity, yes, and yet there is rejoicing. Rejoicing in the assurance of our salvation, and it's only found in him. We read of stones being referred to as precious at times, don't we? There's there's different categories of stones. There's common stones. There's gemstones, which are of some value. But then there are precious stones. They're in a category all of their own. Christ's blood was in a category all of its own. Why? Because it's his because it's the precious blood of Christ. And only Christ's blood could make atonement for your soul. He was the only perfect man. He's the only perfect man. No other was able to make that sacrifice. No other blood was acceptable to God. Is Christ precious to me? His love, his blood, his person, his divinity, his humanity, his deity, his birth, his baptism, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his second coming, his atonement. What effect the appreciation of this atonement has on our lives and has upon our worship. The day of atonement It was a day of necessity. It was a day of humility. It was a day of solemnity. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts once again this evening. I'm going to ask our brother David if he would close in prayer, please. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary so that we could be saved from our sins. Father, we thank thee that we're not ashamed of the blood of Christ. Rather, we're thankful for it. We praise you for it because that blood still has the power to transform lives today. Mm. We thank you, Lord, that we sing often your blood shall never leave us apart. And Lord, that's not just talking about its ability to save souls and to keep saving souls until Christ comes back. But Lord, it's talking about its power to keep us for all eternity, its forever power, everlasting power. And Father, the salvation we have because of this wonderful atonement bought by Christ is an eternal salvation. We can never lose it. Mm. We can never be plucked out of our hands. Father, we thank thee for such a mighty sacrifice and we thank you for such a mighty saviour mm. and father as we meditate upon these things as we think about them in the days that lie ahead of us as we think once again of what we have learned already this past week what we shall learn in the fiery sky even tomorrow evening lord we pray that our thoughts will constantly be turned back to the son of god who loved us and gave himself for us Father, we praise you this evening that our atonement is still available today for those of your company. We think of our loved ones outside of Christ. We think of our friends, Father, who don't know the Savior, some that the only use of name ever was Christ. Mm. 
Father, we pray that you would continue to be merciful to us. Lord, that you would continue to be gracious to us. Uh, speaking to their hearts by your spirit and bringing them across their paths, ourselves and others who will share Christ with them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would save their souls forever, before it's forever too late. Lord, we thank you again for thy word and write these truths upon our hearts this evening. And Lord, we just ask now that you would take us and shape us as we go in separate ways for October and November. 